In this video, we are going to have a look how this huge noise, this purple wafer, which is higher than like 2 volts, how this huge noise can be reduced just by improving layout, just by understanding what is happening on your PCB. And once the layout is improved, this is how the noise looks. It's almost gone. See, the purple uh, line is almost flat. What changes we made, you will see in this video. To understand this topic better, you know about noises in RPCBs, I had a call with Eric Bogatin. And uh, as usual, I recorded this call and uh, that's what you will see in this video. Eric is going to start uh, this call with uh, explaining what we already should know. And um, if you feel lost, if you don't understand what Eric is going to talk about, I would recommend you to watch our previous videos with Eric. But uh, also I would like to say uh, you can watch this video and understand this video even without watching our previous videos because Eric has very nice uh, examples and from these examples uh, everyone can understand what uh, we are going to explain. So um, as I said on the beginning we will talk a little bit about uh, what uh, we should already know uh, then uh, how these noises uh, are created on our boards and then we will have some uh, demonstration where on practical examples you will see the differences between the noises for different layouts. Uh, that's everything for introduction so uh, let's do it. Let's play my call with Eric. Here it is. So we want to talk about ground bounce today, right? That's yes. the topic du jour. Okay. And and so um, you know how I always like to um, start out asking questions to kind of get us started. So um, we talked some time ago about crosstalk, and that's when you have an aggressor that's got a signal and it and, and you get some pickup on the on the victim line. And we said there were two mechanisms by which we get um, noise from an aggressor to a victim. And do you remember what those two mechanisms are? Uh, changing fields. Right. And it's changing electric or changing magnetic fields. And, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's the change that causes or induces the noise. And uh, sometimes it's a little hard to, well, well the fun, fundamental mechanism is always about electric and magnetic field coupling, sometimes it's a little hard to kind of conceptualize and, and think through how the fields influence the noise. And so we approximate them with circuit elements. And so changing electric fields, we approximate by capacitive coupling and changing magnetic fields, we approximate by inductive coupling. And I, I think the last time we chatted, we looked at the case where we have a nice wide return plane. And so microstrip or strip line, and we said, okay, in that environment, which is more important? Which generates more noise, the capacitive coupling or the inductive coupling? And do you remember what the answer was? Very surprising. No, I answer. remember. It's uh, they are uh, approximately same, but also I think it depends exactly. if they are micro strip or strip line. Yeah. So to zero the order, they're basically the same. But you're absolutely right. In micro strip, the inductive coupling is a little bit larger than the capacitive coupling. Um, and that gives rise to a particular behavior we see in far end crosstalk, whereas in strip line, wherever we have uh, planes on, on, on uh, either side of the signal line, in that environment, um, in strip line, the inductive and capacitive coupling is almost exactly the same. Uh, and so both of them are important. And likewise in microstrip, yeah, inductive coupling is a little bit larger, maybe 20% larger than capacitive coupling, but they're both equally important. We have to worry about both of them. And that's in the case where we have a nice wide return plane. And now 
if we do anything to screw up that wide return plane, so it is a pin in a package, or it is a um, uh, a lead in a in a in a connector, or it is um, in a ribbon cable, and uh, and we have one of the wires as a as the return, or if in a circuit board um, we have um, uh, some uh, a gap in the return path because we have some uh, signal that's been routed on on the ground layer and and we have a keep out region and that makes a, a gap. If we have um, uh, a clearance holes that are too close together and they overlap and they make a gap, any of these things that make the return path anything other than a nice wide plane is going to increase capacitive inductive coupling. But it turns out the amount of capacitive coupling that increases is tiny. It's a small, it's a, a few percentages. But the impact on the inductive coupling because of that discontinuity in the return is huge. It can be an order of magnitude or larger. And, and, and is it in, because the yeah. path, return path is longer? It's the return path is long. So the, remember in a, in a uh, geometry where you have a nice wide return plane, the return current is underneath the signal line if you screw up that path under the signal line, so you force the return current to, to spread to the side, you've increased the, in, the loop inductance in the signal path and increased the mutual inductance with the return path, uh, with, with a, um, a, a victim line. And it's the combination of screwing up the return path and that automatically, anything other than a wide plane will dramatically increase the loop inductance of the aggressor, that's the first thing. And the second thing you need is shared return path. Mm -hmm. So the victim has to have its return that shares that screwed up path. And that will dramatically, order of magnitude, increase the inductive coupling. And so it's the combination of a screwed up return path and shared return path that dramatically increases crosstalk. So basically ground bounds is the case when uh, multiple currents are flowing through the same place? Same screwed up place. Okay. In other words, the signal and return have been pulled apart or distorted in some way. Anything other than where that return current naturally wants to flow into the signal line, anything other than that will dramatically increase the inductance of the signal return path of the aggressor. And if that return path is shared, the mutual inductance between the aggressor and the victim will also be increased. So and we can say mutual, like currents sorry, are mixing yeah. together. Currents are mixing together, right. And so like they said in um, in Ghostbusters, the, the first version of Ghostbusters, whatever you do, don't, where they don't cross the streams, that don't cross, don't share, or overlap the return current path for the aggressor and the victim if it is screwed up, otherwise dramatically increases crosstalk. It doesn't mean that okay, if you have a nice wide plane, there's no crosstalk. There still is. There's still far end and near end. There's capacitive inductive crosstalk. They're comparable magnitude. You got to worry about both of them, but it's dramatically lower than the case when there's a wide plane. And that's why I always say, hey, if you haven't established a continuous return path for your signals, don't worry about near and far and crosstalk because you're going to be screwed by the ground bounds you got to fix that problem first. So and this kind why, of uh, ground sorry. bounce can be even like higher noise than just... Huge amount of noise. And I've got a little demo here to show you just how much that noise can be. So this is a two-layer board. Really simple. It's got three regions. Uh, let's see, the, the top region over here is designed actually for jumper wires. Looking at cross because we also teach in, in my class we teach um, good prototyping skills using solderless breadboards. And there with discrete wires, huge amount of ground bounce. We're not going to touch that. We're going to look at the bottom two, which are uh, traces on the circuit board. And this is a really simple board, two layers. Um, in this region in the middle, there's no return plane. There's just one layer of traces on the board. In fact, let me get these out of the way so we can see what we've got. Um, so in, in this board, um, this region here is um, no return plane. In this region here, uh, we have a solid uh, return plane underneath. So, and so, uh, all, so the middle sorry. one is basically one layer PCB. One layer PCB, exactly right. And, and um, on the 
bottom side here, you can kind of see that. This is, you know, this is the bottom here. This is um, the middle region, no return plane. It's just um, signals on the top layer. The uh, region over here, here you can see obviously the ground plane. Um, and we have, again, traces on the top. And so I'm gonna flip it around here. And this and, is standard uh, uh, 63 mils or 1.6 yep. millimeter PCB. Yep. Yep. Okay. It's about a, yes, 1.6 millimeter thick dielectric. Um, and we're using the six mil wide line, uh, typical of the low cost uh, internet PCB shops. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna, I've got a bunch of parallel wires or parallel traces here. Nothing fancy. I mean, uh, the spacing is pretty large. It's like a hundred mils or so. I'm going to drive them with signals over here. I'm actually going to use the um, uh, digital IO from a, a little microcontroller board in order to generate the signals. And, um, and remember, because it's inductive coupling, um, and you, you, you said it right at the beginning that what causes the crosstalk is changing field. So in this case, we have screwed up the return path and we're going to have um, changing fields. The, the coupling is going to be dominated by inductive coupling and it's only the changing magnetic fields that induce a current on the victim line. And so when we have current flowing through the aggressors, I'm going to have a, a number of aggressors we can sequentially uh, turn on or turn on in various ways. I'm going to have um, ag aggressor signals in these lines the only time they're going to induce noise on the quiet line, the poor victim line over here, is when those magnetic field lines change. And the time when those magnetic field lines change is when I have changing current, and that's when the IOs are switching. And that's okay. why we call, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. That, that's why we call ground bounds, because it happens during the IO switching, we call it switching noise. All of these aggressors, as each one turns on, they all have this common return wire. And as I turn on more and more of these simultaneously, I get more and more DIDT through the common return. Now the victim line sitting over here, it's just going down to the end and I'm gonna connect the, um, the, the return for that victim line with a little switcher, I can make it share that common return. And remember, because it's a single line, a single trace on the board and not a plane, I've screwed up that return path, right? And all I've done is I've made a loop. It's a pickup coil here with one loop. Uh, one In one case, the loop is uh, short, is using the same return path. Yeah, that half the of the loop is using same. Half the loop is using yeah. the same return, right? So it's that definition of a screwed up return path and a shared return okay, path. Okay, I understand. And then the second case, I switched the little switch over and I'm gonna use a separate return I still have a loop and I still have DIDT over here. I still have changing magnetic. I, I created a bunch of these loops here. I have changing magnetic field lines. Some of that is going to go through the adjacent loop, but it, as we'll see, it will be dramatically reduced. So I'll still have switching noise. I'll still have ground balance, but a lot less. Okay. Okay. So that's the setup for the first one. So let's take a look at that. So I'm going to connect it in here and I'm going to, we're going to look and see. I don't remember which um, um, which uh, code or which pattern I'm running. So let's look and see what the pattern is. Okay, so I, I wrote the little microcode here. And, um, and, and so I'm going to change the number of IO. So this is increase. I'll show you what that code looks like. I mean, it's really simple, but it's basically, these are um, the, the bits that are gonna switch. And I've got the first one, this is pin 13 is going to switch and the others aren't, then they're all going to turn off. Then um, 13 and 12 are going to switch simultaneously, the others, and then turn off. And then three, three IO switching sometimes, four IO switching, five IO switching, and six IO switching simultaneously. And, and then we repeat it again. So, so these are the, the first... uh, diode 13, diode 12, 11, 10, yep. 9, 8, what we yeah. see on the PC. So these are going to be the six IOs from the little microcontroller board switching simultaneously. Okay. And and I use a special command that switches it simultaneously rather than sequentially, and we'll see the impact of that. So that's the that's the code that I'm running right now. And so that means that um, the IOs, and I don't know if you can see, let me see. 
Yeah, it's it's hard in this camera light. Maybe if I make it a little darker. Here, can you see the LEDs on? Yeah, I can see them, yeah. Yeah, and, and the first one is brighter, and this is a little dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because this is on every every switch. This is on every other time we go through. Mm -hmm. This is on every third and fourth minute. So they're going to increase sequentially. And so now we're going to look at the aggressor signals. And so let me pull up my – well, put in the probe. This is um, where pin 13 is switching. Let's see here. So here is pin 13 switching. So I'm going to put in my probe here. Okay. So that's that's going to be my reference that I'm going to trigger the scope from. And, uh, and here's the scope. And what we're looking at here is that pin 13. And you can see this one turns on. This is you know, the clock period, well, this is basically one, one clock period is turning on and then off. And the next clock period, two of them are turning on, this one included. Mm -hmm. And this one is three of them turning on, four and five. And here's six of them turning on. Okay, so this is going to be my reference signal. And, you know, just to make it easier, let me, let's see if we can't um, expand it out a little bit, just so we can see it a little bit better here. And I'm going to start it from the end Here we go. So we're starting over here, and we have one bit, two, three, four, five, six, six bits switching simultaneously. And then we turn it off, wait a little bit, and then we start over again. Okay, now we're going to look at our victim line. And I have the switch, so it's going to use a common return. And so what do you think the noise is going to be like for common return? Now, one thing you got to know is what's the rise time of the signal, rise and fall time. So um, in, you know, I can zoom out, and we can look at it on the screen. Or I'm just going to turn on a little measurement function here to uh, calculate the rise time for us. It'll, it's going to go in and measure the rise time of each of the signals here. And um, uh, let's see. So this is a horizontal measurement. I'm looking for a rise time. Here we go. Here's rise time. So we're at 4 nanosecond rise time. And, um, and, and the resistors are 50 ohms. So And you get a 2 volt drop across the... Um, the, the LED, it's four volt out. So, you know, we can estimate the current. Let's see, it's uh, um, four volts is coming out. You subtract off the two volt from the four drop in the LED. That's two volts across 50 ohms. So we're talking something in the order of about uh, two volts and 50 ohms. So that's about 40 milliamps. So it's on the order of about 40 milliamps per IO, which is about the max you can get from uh, from one of these pins. And, and it's turning on in uh, four nanoseconds. So it's about 10 milliamps per nanosecond per IO that switches. Okay. So it's, you know, so it's a, you know, it's a typical amount of, of kind of DIDT in a lot of drivers. And now let's turn on um, uh, uh, channel two here. So, so let's go back to the picture. So here's channel two, and we're going to look at the victim line. And here is the victim line, that's going to be this guy over here. And I've got the switch, so I'm going to get the common return here. So half of the loop is shared together. Half with the of pin. the loop is shared, right. So there we go. And now let's look at the scope. I'm going to make the scope a little bit bigger here so we can see the whole thing. Wow. Oh, and my it, gosh. It's supposed to be zero. It's supposed to be zero, right. And um, let's see. You know what we can do is, uh, um, well, if I turn off, um, I'll turn on one I/O. So um, uh, let's see. So, so here's we're we doing this in real time here. I'm going to create another little bit of code here, and this is going to be one switching, and then I'm going to I'm going to create this as void is going to be a function it's going to be one and and we're going to grab just pin 13 that's the only one that we're going to switch and that way we'll be able to see uh, what the noise is like and then we're going to come over here and we're going to add another option here and this is going to be one and then I'm going to turn this one off and so 
Now we've got the code so that only one I.O. is going to switch. That's it. And you'll see the little bit of noise from that one switching, and then everything will be off, and you'll be able to see what the noise level is like. So we're mm -hmm. uploading the code, and we'll see only one pulse, and then we'll see the, the zero afterwards. Now only D13 will be switching. Right. Let's see how we're doing here. Compiling, compiling, piling, you know, da -da 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 -da. a little slow here, but we'll get there. And so we'll look at what the noise is like. Okay, we're uploading and now we're running the code and here it is. And you can see that single pulse that switches and yeah, there, we get some ground bounce when that guy switches, but look over here. In fact, let's zoom in on this stuff here and this is um, this is self-aggression noise. This is noise that the power ground rail on this die creates on itself because of its own current switching. And this is the noise on the power rail on the die compared to the, the power rail and the ground rail that's on the board. And so we have to kind of change the way we think about that's why I hesitate using that word ground, and I'll sometimes refer to it as local ground. Ground is different everywhere on the board, and the ground on the die is different from the local ground on the circuit board. And what the scope is measuring, what it's using as its reference is local ground on the board, and it's measuring the voltage, because we're looking at the IO when he's low, so his output is connected to the local ground on the die, and we're using ah, that that I/O as okay. a probe to connect to us what's going on on the die. So our is, ground sorry. ground may be clean, but the ground of the pin is not clean. Exactly, exactly. So this noise, this specific noise that we're looking at, is the voltage noise on the rail on the die. The whole rail is going up and down. You know, it's about 50 millivolts per division here. It's, I don't know, it's maybe 60, 70 millivolts peak to peak. The voltage on the die, the whole die, is going up and down I 60 now. millivolts compared to the local ground on the board. Okay, I understand And that's why now. this is self-aggression noise. And anybody that's on the die that's sending stuff out is going to see this. Mm -hmm. So every I.O. is going to see this. Now, having said all that, this may not be a problem on the die because everybody on the die there's if you look at the logic circuits on the die itself everybody's going up and down they have no idea they're going up and down relative to the board and so this doesn't tell the whole story about the noise on the die we have to look at the noise on the vdd rail and then it's the difference the, and we'll have the same effect that is noise on the VDD rail on the die compared to on the board. And we're going to look at what, what we sometimes call rail compression. That is, if you're on the die and you're a logic gate on the die, compared to the external world, you may be bouncing all around, but, but everybody on the die is going to be bouncing the same. And so you may not have much noise on the die. And that's where we'll do it on another another session here that's where you have to look at the voltage noise on the vdd rail we get a quiet high the voltage noise on the vss rail quite low and take the difference and that is the rail compression on the die but once and you connect it to different chip then it may become problem well that's when the io will have relative to you know what comes off the io in fact that's what that's what we're seeing here the io coming off has this noise when it's low it's you know 60 millivolts yeah. relative to the board yeah and everybody that's talking to that io is going to see that ground bounce noise i understand now okay we can go back to our board okay uh so i'm just um adjusting the uh the scale here here we go so so all i did was i moved this um I'll move it down a little bit more here let's see where's zero I like nice whole numbers on my scales. Makes it easier to see things. There we go. Okay, so here's that one IO switching. 
and you can see just faintly in the background this is the ground bounce noise on the io uh, on on the ground rail um relative to from the die relative to the board tiny amount right not very significant that's one io switching and now let's turn on i still have my victim line over here so let's turn him on and 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 he's sharing that that io so let's let's turn him on and oh i've got you know really zoomed in there let me zoom out on him okay so here's the ground bounce noise this is off the die this is measuring the ground bounce on this poor victim line and and i've got the shared return so i have one loop here signal return and i've got another one here signal with a shared return two loops the aggressor one io switching the victim another loop sitting here but sharing that screwed up return path and here's the ground bounce noise and you can see let's see this one turns on and so we've got this um i don't know it's a little hard to see let me increase the scale a little bit okay so here's 200 millivolts per division it's almost 200 millivolts about 180 millivolts i'm, I'm sorry no it's almost 400 millivolts yeah. here this is 400 millivolts it's made 380 millivolts and then here's the second one and he goes so this one turning on the voltage goes up this one the current turns off the voltage goes down but i also have all this ringing going on um, and that's ringing noise um, in this loop that i've created um, it's just um, you know the loop is ringing compared to i got some uh, uh, in inductance in in this quiet loop and i've got some probe capacitance and they make an lc circuit and i've just twanged it i've just kicked it with the uh, uh, DIDT uh, over here. I, I just made a note, ask you, what is the frequency of the ringing? <laughs> and you, you just oh. answer it how this Yeah, is. that's what it depends on. Um, and we, we can delve into that a little bit more um, next time. Okay, so I, have, is, I have another question. Okay. If, the, if the shared path is shorter, is this, this should be lower, I guess. Very good, exactly right. Because this is about the LDIDT or the MDID, the mutual inductance times the DIDT. If we were to um, reduce the length of this loop, right now, because of the shared path, the mutual inductance is dominated by that um, inductive, the, in, the total inductance of that return path. If I make it shorter, I get less mutual inductance. So I'll have less ground bounce. So basically, exactly right. on your board, uh, the currents, they may flow through same places, but as minimum or as short as possible right and that's why we want to keep the discontinuity as short as we can because that will decrease the mutual inductance so as a general design guideline if you're going to screw up the return path keep that discontinuity short and so but we got you know in this case look one io switching we get almost 400 millivolts and this guy here when he turns off oh my gosh we got yeah. minus you know almost 800 millivolts Peak to peak, it's see one, two, three, four, five, six, one point two volts of ground bounce noise. Let me put these on the same scale so you can kind of see the perspective here. They're both one volt per division. You can see a pretty large substantial fraction of the of the noise. Right? For, for so one thing. One eye one one eye of switching. And he's pretty far away. He's way over here, right? But his return is through that common shared loop now let's try this i have another pattern i can turn on so we're turning on uh the first one and then everybody is off let's turn on the first one we'll look at that noise we'll turn him off and then we'll turn on the current in the second loop and then we'll turn it off and then current the third loop and the fourth and fifth we'll look at each one one at a mm -hmm. time but we'll cycle through and see as we get closer hey what's going to happen to that ground okay bounce? i'm curious what if do you think is going to happen uh, the theoretically, uh, the last one will have probably highest effect, but uh, it's mm, theoretically all the others should be like similar, I would expect. Because well, the distance probably yeah. may not play big role because they are far away from each other. The problem is the shared path. Right. It's the shared path. And what's changing in the shared path? As I turn on each one sequentially, 
what's changing about the shared current path. is same isn't yeah you're absolutely right you're absolutely right now there is so so to first order i wouldn't expect much impact to second order the closer i bring the aggressor remember i've got the signal going out this way and it's coming back this way the closer i bring the aggressor signal line the less magnetic fields i'm going to have on the common return because some of his field lines from the current moving this way are going to cancel out some of these ah, field lines anyway a little bit because a little the bit direction one goes this way and yes the they're opposite way. and so that's why the closer you bring signal and return the less crosstalk you oh, really? closer you couple <laughs> signal and return less crosstalk to an aggressor okay and so see. we'll see us we should see a small effect let's see so so we're gonna we're gonna change the code that's running so here's the sketch and we we were running the one and then i'm gonna i'm gonna use this code the sequential we turn one on at a time mm -hmm. and we just move it down the, the mm -hmm. line so let's turn off this one and i'm going to turn on the sequential okay now we're going to upload that code and so we're going to see the first one switch, nothing else switching, but we're going to see noise as the others, because I'm only looking at pin 13, mm -hmm. that's just going to fire once, but we'll see the noise generated. Um, and it shouldn't change much, but I think it'll get a little bit bigger when we get closer. But that's second order. The first order should be about the same. And so let's just check and see how we're doing with that. It's compiling. There we go. Yep, uploading, uploading, uploading. We're done, and here's the result. Now, wow. Not don't see a whole lot of impact. About the same. But the last not one is smaller. You are right. It it looks a little smaller, um, and you know that's kind of what we expected. But yeah, I'm going to increase the scale so we can see a little bit better. Okay, you know what? Maybe you can see it. So I'm not sure why it kind of peaks here. Maybe because of the you know, the, 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 all the IO may not have exactly the same rise time, but you can see the closer we get, you know, that peak value is dropping off a little bit. And it's um, because and, the fields are canceling each other. Right, right. We're getting the, the uh, aggressor closer to its re the common return path, and that's decreasing the fields a little bit. Second order, not a big impact, but it, in this case, we're able to see it. Okay. Yeah, so we get field lines from the aggressor, are going to be around the return in the opposite direction from the returns current and that's going to help decrease the number of field lines in there so another time we can do about field magnetic field lines around conductors because there's a lot of um wow. what's the term i i see a lot of people talking about inductance and magnetic field lines and boy is there a lot of confusion out there about the correct way of thinking about it and so um I'll, I'll plug my signal and integrity book. I have another book out, it's been a while, Signal and Power Integrity Simplified. And I tried to be very careful in that book to establish a really good foundation in how to think about uh, loops and magnetic field lines and inductance. So if anybody wants a preview, you can grab a copy of um, Signal and Power Integrity Simplified. Um, but we'll, so we can is, talk about is that it online another or? time. Uh, no, it's, uh, uh, you can get it through Amazon. It's oh, published okay. by Prentice Hall. Um, and it's basically, you know, if you've taken a, a, a sophomore E and M class, uh, even then they don't teach inductance very well. Um, uh, but I try to describe it clearly in my in my textbook. But we'll we'll spend time on that another time. But this is the case. Let's look at that noise. This is the case when I've got a common return. One I O switching, getting closer and closer. Common return. While we're here, um, let's. Let's try, um, should we change the return and make it um, uh, a, a different return? Mm. No, let's do, do all of you, them at once. All of then, them, okay. Yeah. Let's turn them all on. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna turn off this, and now this is gonna turn, off, turn on sequentially one after the other. So we'll have a lot of IO switching, six altogether. Um, and and so here's what the code looks like. And so it's one switching, two switching, three, four, five, six simultaneously. 
And you have to be careful when you write the code because not all, um, depending on what device you're using, you have to make sure they're switching simultaneously. Okay, so we're compiling. So now, and we're still looking at a common return. That's going to be the worst case we're ever going to see. On and the last so here pin, we, we should see the biggest noise. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm changing the scale here on the on the scope. Wow. So they're on the same scale. Look, one volt per division for both. Here's with one of them switching, two, three, four, five, six. Look at that. I have I have two volts, almost four volt peak to peak. Can we move it down so noise. they have the same ground? Uh okay. The purple so, one, yeah. Okay, yeah, so they're okay. both centered at ground, and and now you can see that huge amount of ground bounce. It's two volts peak of ground bounce, peak to peak. We're talking, uh, 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 you know, more than three volts of ground bounce noise. As we increase the number of I/O, the DIDT increases. The uh, mutual inductance is about the same for all of them, and we get that larger and larger amount of ground bounce noise. When you simulate your circuit, can you simulate also this? Oh, absolutely. But you have to have a good model for the mutual inductance. So that's the that's the challenge is you got to have a good model for the mutual inductance. So you, you the, need to include sorry. some element into your simulation circuit, which will uh, show the shared pad or something. Yeah, exactly. Shared inductance, okay. total inductance and shared. Now, the best tool out there to take a in this case, um, uh, is you know, this traces on the board. Um, there's also the package leads. The best tool out there to take a package or a connector and generate that SPICE model that has all the shared inductances so you can decide, given the path you take for the signal and returns, how much ground mouse. Best tool out there is ANSYS um, Q3D. It's built into their electronic desktop. Uh, because it will calculate the inductance matrix and the SPICE model to allow you to take into account these factors. Who is the manufacturer of the software? Uh, ANSYS. They make HFSS. Ah, okay. I think they're the world's largest simulation company right now. Wow. Okay. Um, Still, this is really important to know because uh, this means when someone, for example, design two-layer PCB and they have, let's say, some logic gates, uh, they may think they have clean signals or ground, and this is what may be happening. And this is crosstalk on the board. This is the crosstalk between the aggressors that are switching here on the board and their shared return, and with the victim line, the shared return for the, the those signal lines. Right. And, and in a minute here, we're going to switch to this region here, and you'll see the dramatic difference when we have um, nice wide return path on the board. First, let's now, let's try the the unshared path. Okay, let's we'll switch this over. Now let's you know, tell you what. Let's save this mm -hmm. so we can see it. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say let's save the waveform. But this uh, is, I this is put really in... big, like two volts. If that's a really, this is really, really big. big. Yeah. If you have uh, like a reset or something, then it may even like. Oh, absolutely. It will absolutely reset. trigger yeah. an I.O. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so there it's saved. So we can compare it. Uh, now, let's. I'm just going to move this switch so that the return is now a separate return. And what do you think is going to be the impact? This is, I call it rule number nine, thinking about anticipating what you expect to see. So I'm going to change the return. What's going to happen to the, the crosstalk? I hope. So I'm going to have a separate smaller. return. Right. A separate return. So this the victim line is going to be signal return. It's going to be a separate loop. I'm still going to have all these guys switching. They're still going to contribute DIDT, but it's going to be a lot less because it's not shared. Okay, there we go. And now let's see how much. Ooh, oh my gosh. I'm going to put this over here. And this is just influence of layout. Layout, exactly right. And this is just because we have a um, better a, layout, a, a, a separate return, right? Now, while we're here, let me just save this as well. I'm going to save this in M, M2 here. 
Okay, so now we have a record of that. So this that is process. basically proof that uh, designing boards is not only about connecting pins. Right. <laughs> you have to pay just as much attention to the return as you do the signal to minimize ground bounce. And that's why I say, you know, there's you design for connectivity, which is just about connecting pins. But once you've done that, everything about design is all about noise control. So you have connectivity, and that's what most most layout folks pay attention to is connectivity. Really important. But once you've got connectivity, everything else is about noise. And ground bounce is so in my PCB class, this is an introductory class. I teach two kinds of noise, both switching noise, because these are the most important types of noise, the biggest source of noise you will always see. The first type of switching noise is ground bounce. The second type of switching noise is noise on the power rail because of IO switching or uh, core logic switching. Maybe, um, maybe something for our next video. <laughs> another time, another time, right. Um, so this is when we have one layer of routing traces and a separate return. Pretty dramatic reduction. We still have ground bounce, and I'm going to increase the scale here. But big difference, like huge difference. Big difference, right? You can see here they're on the same scale, uh, a volt per division, dramatic reduction. So here I've increased the scale, and we still have a lot of ground bounce. I mean, we have 400 millivolts and to 500. We still have a volt peak to peak mm -hmm. of ground bounce here, but it's dramatically less than the four volt peak to peak that we had before. Okay, so this says, yeah, use separate returns, but you're still going to have a lot of ground bounce. Now let's switch the board. And so we'll keep the same code running. And so now we come over here. This is a solid return. There's nothing to switch. We have all these IOs switching, and then we're going to have this victim line, and the victim line. These all have, I don't know if you can see, there's little vias here. Mm -hmm, I see. The returns go to the plane underneath, and this victim line is shorter to the plane underneath, and so we just have this little loop here going down mm -hmm. and then back through the return plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's switch it over. And now let's go to, uh, let me show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect in the signal pin here. And um, let's go, let's go take a look at that. So here's pin 13. That's and we see them. See, remember, we're increasing the number of IO switching each each cycle. And now we'll look at the noise on the victim line. And um, I'm going to connect in the victim line over here. Okay, and let's see what we got. And here's the noise on the victim line. And you can see, you know what? There's still ground bounce, or there, I'm sorry, there's still noise, there's still crosstalk. When the IOs are far away, dramatically reduced. But look, when we get really so close. Is hmm, this different kind of crosstalk? This well, is this like is, real crosstalk. Uh, this is not ground bounce, uh, but this is the crosstalk. Right. And and I, I call it, it's not ground bounce uh, because we have a nice wide continuous plane, but we still have capacitive and inductive coupling. And um, now I have these on a different scale. So that's scale, what so is gonna, picked up sorry. from the trace which is routed on the top. Uh, the aggressor, the trace on the top is uh, making all this noise around it and the other one is picking it up because right. it's routed so we have close to... Both, mm -hmm. Right, we have both capacitive and inductive coupling. And But you know what, look, we have a loop here. Signal and the return is the plane underneath. That's still a loop. And we've got a loop over here. So there's still inductive crosstalk. And so we're still going to see crosstalk, but it's going to be dramatically less. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just see, you know, this is when they're all switching. And you can see, boy, it really increases uh, getting closer. We'll, we're going to run the sequential one. Only uh, the last one here. is like biggest one. Right. And we'll see why that is in a second. Let's, I'm going to put them on the same scale as over here. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So they're on one volt per division. And let's see if I can move it over here, if, if we can see it. It's really hard to see. Um, so let's see. I'm going to Maybe you I'm can move, move them, like, uh, make them separate. Well, here, here we go. So the pink is what we had with the separate return. Mm -hmm. And they're on the same scale. And the, the um, 
the bright one is the the crosstalk with um, uh, the solid return. And and so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna increase the scale for both of the oops for both of them. Got to um, so you do this one first. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's 100 millivolts of division. Then I'm gonna increase this guy's scale to the same. Okay, so they're on the same scale, 100 millivolts per division. The light pink was what we had with the um, uh, the the separate return, but still on the top surface. And the the bright pink is the one with um, the the plane. So it's dramatic, you know, reduced. There's still crosstalk there. Now uh, we're going to try one other little experiment here. So remember, here's the crosstalk. This is with all of them switching simultaneously. Let's make them sequential. In other words, we're going to switch um, one at a time, but we're going to move them closer, and we'll look to see what is the impact of, each of individual. turning this one on, look at the mm -hmm. crosstalk from this one on the victim, this one, this one, this one, and what do you expect to see? What do you think you're going to see? I think the last one will be like the most visible, and all the other very will good. be very much smaller. Very good. I would expect exactly the same thing. So let's see where we're at with it. Compiling, compiling, compiling. And here we go. Turn it off, turn it on. And sure enough, look at that. So here is the last one. Here's Here are the ones far away switching. Yeah, okay, there's a little bit. Remember, we're on 100 millivolts of division here. A little bit of switching noise, a little bit, a little bit. Ooh, dramatic increase because of the and, proximity. And all this uh, dramatic increase is because the uh, noise is transferred also through the air and, and the dielectricum. It's not, it's not uh, the shared path which is right. causing major, majority right. of this. It's the magnetic field lines from the two loops that are spatially separated. There's still field lines between them. Hey, it's not a lot. I mean, it's you know 200 millivolts peak to peak or so compared to four volts peak to peak that we were seeing before but so it's nice it's on. nice to see that now uh, there is there is the effect going through the air basically or medium right. or something right exactly so the lesson from all this is number one if you want to reduce ground bounds don't use a shared return path if you do make it as short as practical and you always want to route the board with a solid return now this is, you know, in, in the world of signal integrity, we say there are three families of problems to worry about. There's signal integrity, there's power integrity, and there's EMI. Ground balance is one of those topics that holistically interacts with all three of those. Mm -hmm. We've only been looking here at the signal integrity part and crosstalk. But the same mechanism that causes ground bounce, because like you said, you get these field lines around the air. Well, they don't stay just on the board. They can expand outward. And it's the ground bounce from a screwed up return path that generally can create the largest range uh, magnetic field changing, change magnetic fields. And that contributes to, you get you see it as near field and that can expand to far field. And that's where you fail FCC. And so if you have ground bounce on your board, chances are you, number one, have near field emissions and probably far field emissions as well. And that's why, and so you wanna reduce ground bounce for reducing crosstalk. You also wanna reduce ground bounce in order to reduce radiant emissions. And that's why when you're designing a board, never ever route the signals all over the board, top and bottom layers, and then when you're done, copper fill on the top and copper fill on the bottom thinking that oh you've done all the you you created all the return paths and you're and you're done worst thing you could possibly do you want to select the uh adjacent layer as a ground solid return and you want to route the signals and mix signal power on the other layer so anyway, that's the approach that i recommend as a starting place because that'll reduce the signal quality problems noise it'll reduce crosstalk uh it'll reduce emi so how is it possible that the old boards, you know, with many gates on two layer routed, how is it possible they worked? Oh, oh 
the connectivity, no problem. Connectivity is great. And in this particular microcontroller board, which is designed kind of that way of random connections on the top and bottom and copper fill, the, the noise margin for this microcontroller is great. It's really large. Oh, um, that's so, why they were, they used to be five volts because then there was huge. A huge margin, right. And so there's good margin on this board. Uh, and so um, it will work. However, um, in fact, I use this as an example of near field radiated emissions um, because this radiates like crazy. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and so work is not the same as low noise. This one works but it does not have low noise. We see it as crosstalk. Uh, we see it as power rail noise. We see it as near field emissions. Um, and that's where, uh, you know, I, I, I tell my students that, you know, once you have connectivity established, then everything is about noise. And so your, your design may work just fine with a solderless breadboard and with big wires going everywhere it may work because you have connectivity correct, but you'll have a huge amount of noise. And at some point, you're, you're going to have a design where that noise is so bad, it causes errors. And here's, here's my theory about errors these days. Have you ever encountered an electronic system that works fine and then suddenly it just stops working? It doesn't receive controls or something. That's and exactly what that? I wanted to say next. <laughs> how do you fix it? You, you learn, and, and, and my, so my wife has this problem all the time. And I used to make her leave the room where I'd, I'd talk jargon and I'd fiddle around and she'd get bored and leave. And then when she's gone, I'd turn it off and on again and it would work. And, and she caught on to what I was doing. And, and, and she learned now that if, if her computer or she has the remote control on the TV or something, if it stops working, she, she doesn't call me anymore. My, my mystique is gone. Um, my my shine has has dulled. Now she just knows. She turns it off and on, and generally it works. And my theory on that is, you know, a lot of communication channels have uh, error detection and correction. They have parity checking, right? You send a a packet and you do a parity uh, check. It's sensitive to one bit errors. And if you have a one bit error, then uh, the the packet says, okay, I get an error here send that packet again and I'll get it again and do a parity check. But if they're two bit errors, then the parity check won't catch it. And sometimes that new code with the two bit errors changes some register somewhere and it stops working. And by turning it off and on, you reset the registers and okay, it's back again. And so I think a lot of the errors that we see in products that it suddenly, it's just stopped working. What's going on? I think it is two bit errors because of noise, whether I, it's power rail noise, crosstalk noise, some other type of noise. I completely agree because this is what I keep saying. A well-designed board should not freeze, should not crash, should right. just work. Once a board will freeze and you don't know why, yeah. then it may be software or it's hardware. Yeah, and I think it is the two-bit error problem that packets will have information in it that changes the register somewhere that prevents the operation from continuing in some way. Um, and if you implemented two-bit error checking, there'd be a lot of overhead for it, but I think that would catch a lot of the errors or reduce the noise. And so one of the, the principles that we teach in my class is it's not enough to have connectivity. You have to have a way of measuring the noise so you know how much margin you have. And, and you take it as a badge of air, a badge of honor when you can create a board, even if the noise isn't important to you, even if it's low enough, it's not going to cause a problem, but it's a badge of honor. If you can create noise that is really low, the lower it is, the better you're the better. You are showing your, your, yourself as the, as a designer, even if it's not uh, uh, important for the functioning of the product, as long as it doesn't add cost. Mm -hmm. If it's just about design, it, the it lower actually, the noise, I think the I you believe are. it helps because once uh, you, for example, sometimes you can't really influence what is going to be connected to your board. So this may bring additional noise. Sometimes you cannot influence the uh, 
place where, for example, your board is going to work in system or in different temperatures or and there may be additional noise, which could be potentially a problem for your board if it's working somewhere on the edge. But if you design yeah, your board right. as good as right. you can, then it will be working everywhere. Right. Exactly right. You've increased the margin and that get, reduces the risk. And so much of board design and system design is about risk reduction. And if it's free and you can reduce risk, why wouldn't you want to do that if it's just about design? And, and then, you know, I tell my students that, you know, these are habits, principles exactly. that you want to learn that even if it doesn't apply to this design, exactly. the more opportunity you have to practice it, the more important it's going to be in your next design. You, this matters. Basically, you will not... Do you need to finish? Um, no. No, I'm, I'm good. Uh, basically, uh, what I wanted to say is once you learn these good practices, you will always do it because even right. if you will be designing a very simple board, first, it will not look good if experienced engineer make bad layout. So you will still try to do it as good as possible. And secondly, I wouldn't be able to design or do the layout bad way, like, because I can, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you, you learn habits and, um, and other people that use you, uh, see your designs, use your design as a reference. Design. Exactly. Hey, they'll, they'll learn some of your good habits as well. And they will make opinion about the designer who designed the board. Yes. Yes. Uh, what Very I would good. like to point out, uh, this noise is not, uh, uh, the frequency is not important. You still can have noise. That's what I would like to right. point out in this, uh, our example. Because right. you exactly know, some right. people may think, uh, I'm not designing high speed, so I don't care about this. You do because your board may reset or it may freeze. You may get faulty interrupts or something because of this noise. Right. And where does the noise occur? I mean, when we, let me move this guy over here. Where, where's the noise happening? It's happening on the edges. I can have a, a one megahertz, I can have a 50 kilohertz clock, but if it has those edges, every time there's an edge, that's where I'm going to have noise. And you could say, well, okay, if I'm only going to have it on an edge, I'll just use a long period and I'll keep the noise on the edge. So my setup and hold time in the middle here is really clean perfectly reasonable way of doing it and that's how we used to do it in the in the olden days you you use a long enough period so that or unit interval so that the noise happens on the edge and you put your setup and hold it in the middle there but that means that you're leaving performance on the table and you're also slowing down your clock uh, well, in order to reduce the noise also this will not help with asynchronous signals like what i said exactly yeah yeah like reset or say, interrupt yeah or if you've got, um, you know, even a, a, a standard bus, a SPI or, or I squared C bus, um, the, the, um, the setup and hold time for I squared C is in the middle there, but you have other operations going on that can occur in the middle there uh, where I or- It mess up your transfer, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, so that's why you can't rely on um, moving the switching noise uh, or making the period long enough so you can move your setup and hold in the middle because you may have other guys that are switching there as well. You got to reduce the noise at the source. Okay. I wanted to ask a last question what I have on my paper. I don't want to take much more of your time. Uh, a little bit. So uh, we learned that uh, we don't want to share this uh, current uh, return current path with other signals because longer this shared path is uh, worse the noise is going to be uh, but uh, if this uh, shared path is very short it's not going to be problem yeah? because for example if you have like signals routed this way and signals routed this way and the return uh -huh. currents are this way and then return currents are this way then it's okay yeah right if they're orthogonal there's the signal is orthogonal return currents are orthogonal they don't overlap uh, on the other layer you can have other uh, direction signals and then right and that's why um dual strip line is really popular you have you know the two planes and x and y routed signal lines what you want to watch for is especially in bj escapes 
where you have signals going in the same direction on yeah. different layers, that's that's when, of course, it's not so much ground bounds, but it's just, you know, capacitive inductive coupling will be larger when it's broadside coupled. If they are on neighbor it's, layers. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But if, you, if they are, uh, for example, separated by ground plane, then uh, the current uh, for higher speed signals or higher frequency signals, it doesn't travel too deep to the copper. So uh, on exactly one side right. of the copper, they will be traveling this way, on the other one, other way, and they are not going to even cross each other, correct? Right. So the rule of thumb to remember is um, about skin depth, that in one ounce copper, the skin depth is at, at 10 megahertz is just a little thinner than the geometrical thickness of one ounce copper. Mm -hmm. So at frequencies above 10 megahertz, the return currents for signal line on one side is in a different part of the return plane than the return current for the other on the other layer. Mm -hmm. So above 10 megahertz, those return currents don't overlap. Okay, that's interesting. But very often they use like half uh, half of Z, I think, for for building stack ups. They don't like use one of Z. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's everything. What I wanted to ask. Do you have any? Anything what you would like to add? Uh, no, I think this is a good example of the most important principles of don't share, you know, it's the Ghostbusters. There's don't, uh, don't cross the streams. Um, don't, sh don't screw up the return path. Don't share screwed up return paths. And uh, always use in a two layer board, um, always use the adjacent, uh, or the, the bottom plane as a solid return. If you're going to route Across under, keep them short. So on two layer PCB, uh, for example, route almost everything on the top. And if you have to cross a track, then just go down, make very short connection and go up again. Exactly. It's far better. If you have to go from one side of the board to the other side of the board, it's far better to have multiple short um, cross unders than just going down the bottom and route across the bottom of the board. Because when you route across the bottom on the bottom layer of the board, you have now cut the ground plane in half, guaranteed to have ground bounce. And even if the noise isn't it isn't enough to cause a a, a a switching error, you will generate more EMI. I have one more one more yeah. to add into our video. What do you think about this Arduino connector design with one ground, or maybe I think there are two grounds, or no, there's on one. One. So, for example, yeah. if you are using the analog inputs and uh, everything is returning ret returning back through the one ground on one of the pins. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in this board, the center footprint, there's one ground pin here. Yeah. And there are two grounds over here. Okay. That's it. Um, and and so that means when you have I/O switching, you're going to have ground bounce just because of the I/O switching because of that common return over here. It's, yeah, unfortunate. Um, so for and, example, if you are using yeah, analog inputs, then ideally you would like to use different uh, ground pin for this. Well, so yeah. So for your analog, I mean, it's only 10 bit, so we're not talking a lot, you know, it's five millivolt per step here is the least significant bit. And so, you know, having all the analogs here and having a couple grounds over here, um, the five millivolts of noise you'll often you'll often see, um, but th this is not a high for performance board, and for you know again, five volt logic very robust, um, and so it's probably just fine. But I see so many connectors that have similar kind of design. They're just a few grounds, uh, and so the connector is guaranteed to have ground bounce in it. You want to best design is going to be interleaving. Um, grounds with the signals. So ground signal, ground signal, ground signal. Yeah. Yeah. And that I, will dramatically reduce the I wanted bounds. to point it out this because uh, I I see same people think like, oh I have one ground pin on my connector, but it may not be good enough for several different reasons. Now one other topic uh, another time we'll put on our list is we've been talking about single-ended signals. If we drove these as differential signals, different story. 
And so we'll leave that as a cliffhanger teaser okay. for another event. <laughs> what happens if we have differential signals? Okay. So we'll, we'll do that another time. And we can use exactly the same board to demonstrate that. It's just different code to drive differential signals coming off. Okay. So thank you very much, Eric. Hey, it's always a pleasure chatting with you and uh, look forward to seeing more of your videos. And uh, that's everything for today's video. I would like to say thank you very much to Eric uh, for finding time uh, to create this video and also for uh, giving us this opportunity to see these examples. I think these examples were like super useful. They, they very nicely show how big difference there can be between uh, a layout or better layout. So thank you very much, Eric, for this. And now you. What do you think about these examples? What do you think about this video? Leave comments. If you like this video, don't forget to press like button. If you would like to see my future videos, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye.